Yes, this, the title of the session was not the necessity of philosophy, <laughs> but the necessity of a revolutionary philosophy, which is a slightly different topic. I think Alan will be touching on the other topic a little bit more in his lead-off. But uh, comrades, the, the great uh, 16th century uh, Dutch Jewish philosopher Baruch Spinoza, he once said the following, and I, have, I want you to really pay attention here. He said, it may indeed be the highest secret of monarchical government, monarchical government, uh, and utterly essential to it, to keep men deceived, <laughs> to keep men deceived and disguise the fear that sways them with the specious name of religion, so that they will fight for their servitude as if they were fighting for their own deliverance, and will not think it humiliating, but supremely glorious, to, to spill their blood and sacrifice their lives for the glorification of a single man. That was a long sentence. I'm going to repeat the key parts of it. <laughs> is that the, the, highest secret, the, the, the highest secret of monarchical government is to keep men deceived with religion so that they can fight for their servitude as if, as if they were fighting for their own deliverance. And they won't, think it, they won't think it humiliating but glorious to spill their blood and sacrificed their lives for the glorification of one man, by which he meant the king. Now, I don't think that all comrades comprehend the gravity of these words. Comrades, this, this, these words are fire, they're explosive, because this is a time where European society was under the tight control of, of the absolute monarchs, a rule that was propped up by the Catholic Church's dictatorship over the mind. It was a time of, of, of the religious persecution of millions of people, the execution of tens of thousands on accounts of atheism, heresy, and witchcraft. And to stand up, and to stand up defiantly against the blazing reactionary opposition, and to expose the lie of religion and monarchy, that's the most courageous and revolutionary act. Now, Spinoza was lucky to escape trial for, for, for his uh, crime, probably due to some, uh, some faction of the ruling class protecting him. But nevertheless, the Catholic Church put all of his writings on the index of forbidden books. And even in the Netherlands, which was the most democratic society at that time, it became forbidden to own, distribute, copy, and restate any of uh, uh, Spinoza's ideas, uh, Spinoza's books, or even to rework his ideas. Now, why would mere words have such a, cause such an outcry? You see, these words might seem very simple to you, but if, you, but if you think about them carefully, you'll find one of the most profound truths about class society and the class struggle, which is that in order for any ruling class to sustain itself, it's not enough to rely on the brute force of state repression. It's not enough to have the police, the army, the courts, the prison system. Even more importantly, perhaps, you need a system of ideas that justify the, the existence of the ruling class and its position in society. In other words, you have to con somehow convince people that the rule of this class over, over them is not only natural, but supremely desirable, and e even if this clashes it entirely with the essential needs and aspirations of the majority of people. But if we think about it a little bit more, it also tells, it, 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 we can derive another profound insight from this. Which, which is that every revolutionary class must have a revolutionary philosophy. Spinoza's ideas were revolutionary. They represented the interests of the rising capitalist class, the class of merchants and industrial producers, who, in their fight against, the feudal, against feudalism, based themselves on science and materialist philosophy, which were rapidly uh, advancing in tandem with one another, and which were constantly clashing with the official church doctrine. According to that doctrine, our world was the creation of God. It existed within a strict hierarchy, with the earth at the center of an unchanging universe, man, man as the highest creation of God, the kings at the top of the human world answering to, uh, to no one but God. Now, all the things in this world were copies of the eternal essences which existed in the mind of God. The truth, therefore, could, on, could only be found in religion, and the church, of course, reserved the monopoly of interpreting religion to itself. Now, this is, this is a strain of idealism, which is, which is one of the two main trends in philosophy, i.e. that, that uh, ideas are the primary substance of the world, 
and that matter is only secondary or a derivation of ideas. All religions are idealism, and all idealism ultimately leads to religion. But you see, these religious doctrines were undermined step by step with the advance of science, which, which also stimulated the advance of materialist philosophy. Because with, because with every step forward in science, you, you saw the unfolding of a strictly material world, which exists entirely independently of our, uh, us and our ideas, and operates according to its own inherent laws that can be discovered and understood by the scientific method. There's no, there's no room for any divinity, any capricious God in this, in this world outlook. And that, in short, sums up the materialist outlook of, philo uh, of philosophy, which was, which, essentially, which was essentially Spinoza's outlook and is also our outlook. Now, the blows that this materialist uh, philosophy dealt against the Catholic Church was an, was an essential part of the bourgeois revolution, which swept away the old order and laid the basis for modern capitalism. And these were incredibly advanced ideas. And you read the thinkers of that time, it's, it's, it's amazing reading. And, if, and in fact, Marxism is based on the highest expression of bourgeois philosophy, namely the, the materialism of the French materialists and the dialectics of Hegel. Um, today, however, bourgeois philosophy have, has completely degenerated into the crudest form of subjective idealism. And subjective idealism is a, is a particularly vulgar and primitive strain of philosophy. It's almost like a, how a child sees the world sometimes. <laughs> because it raises the immediate subjective experience to, of the individual to be the absolute. Uh, and, and the most prominent school of, uh, thought, uh, of this thought today is postmodernism. Now, this is a school of thought that took off uh, in, the, in the 70s. And uh, I thought about uh, bringing some quotes so I wouldn't appear as a uh, dilettante just talking about them. But there's not really any point to that because they're not very easy to understand. <laughs> and they are like that for, pur for a purpose in order to cover the crudeness and the reactionary, na uh, reactionary nature. So I decided not to do it. <laughs> but I'm going to tell, tell you what they're about. <laughs> and you, can, you just have to trust me. <laughs> uh, no. Um, so since, since, the, since the emergence of postmodernism is developed into a wide umbrella of ideas and schools of thought and sub-schools and sub-trends and so on and so forth, you have uh, post-colonialism, intersectionality, queer theory, but all of these have a, have a series of fundamental um, principles that they base themselves on. The starting point is that you cannot have a comprehensive worldview. What does that mean? You cannot have a coherent philosophy, they say. You cannot try to, to explain nature and human society al along broad general lines. And they base this, uh, this uh, principle on two fundamental points. First of all, they say that the world is ever-changing and is ever so different. And so um, it's impossible uh, to impose on it a method that can describe it all. Um, and because there, are no, because there are no general laws, and there are no patterns in this world, and, and, and therefore we cannot deduce any general concepts. So according to these people, any, any concept that we might have are, are merely our arbitrary, subjective impositions onto the world. So we just make up, we just make up things about things and say it. <laughs> now, of course, <laughs> This, these, there are a number of contradictions that this uh, mode of thinking runs into. First of all, they refuse the idea of uh, comprehensive worldviews. They make the most sweeping generalization you can ever imagine, and they don't even bother providing any proof. They just say it. You can say it kind of uh, left to faith, in a way. <laughs> but that's not the main point. The, 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 from a philosophical point of view, the essential problem of postmodernism is this extreme one-sidedness. Like, a, as I said, like it's, like a, it's, like, it's literally like a child trying to learn about the world, discovering one side of it and clinging on to that as the whole, except that most children learn that actually the world is a complicated <laughs> series of interpenetrating contradictions. The, the postmodernists start from, a, from our, uh, the character of our knowledge. How, how do we know things? They say that our knowledge is limited by our subjective experience. In, every, in other words, every single one of us are different, and we're all limited beings 
We have, we have weaknesses, we have biases, and therefore we cannot know anything fully. But again, this is, one, this, is, this is correct as one side of the meta, but if you stick to this one side, you will end up in an absurdity. Because if we, cannot, because if we only have our own experience, and, that's, and that is a, a faulty one, how can we know anything at all? How can we even know what we know and what we, what we don't know? Uh, in fact, a lot of mo modern philosophy, uh, modern bourgeois philosophy, openly draw the conclusion that we cannot know if any objective reality exists, and, and hence, it probably doesn't. But then we have to ask the question, if you cannot know uh, reality, how can you prove that any of these things that you experience exists? How, how can you prove that anything besides yourself exists? In fact, you cannot even prove that you exist as a material being. For all we know, we, are all, uh, we, just, we just exist in a matrix and you are all my imagination. <laughs> looking at me speaking, <laughs> admiring me, yeah, <laughs> speaking, speaking nice, uh, profound things. Um, yes, um, and if we cannot know the world or the laws governing it, governing it why would these postmodernists bother writing books or tell us things about this world that we cannot know whether it exists or not? Because they can't be sure whether we exist to read and understand their, their writings and the Anyway, they never give us, the, they never answer this point. But as I said, the problem is that they, they view things always in a one-sided, crude and vulgar manner. From a, from a Marxist point of view, there is an objective reality, which is the material world. It exists independently from, uh, uh, from us, but we are a part of that, of that world. And we can, we can understand it by interacting with it. Now, of course, it's true that every single individual is limited in one way or another. But that's just one side of things, because humans are social animals, and, and knowledge is social by its very nature. Our knowledge is not just the, the, the result of our individual interactions with the world, but the, but the result of billions of interactions of people for over thousands and thousands of years. In cooperation with one another, a social interaction which weighs up the limitations and shortcomings of the, international, of the individual. <laughs> We don't have any limit limitations. <laughs> um, but it's also true for the international, by the way. <laughs> now, and in fact, there's a constant process of knowledge passing from the individual to the social and back again. But the postmodernists never understand this. They also have another point. They say that everything is different. No two things are alike. And I think that it's pretty obvious if we look around us that that's, that's a fact within certain limits. When I look at every single one of you, you're quite different. But at the same time, um, sorry, um, but at the same time, in spite of the constant, in spite of the infinite differences between you, and in spite of the infinite changes which is taking place in, 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 within each one of us the, every, all the time, it's also clear that we have something in common, which in philosophical terms is called an identity i.e. something that, that remains there in spite of the constant change and flux, which makes us human. Now, you would think I would be profoundly stupid if I said that because all of you guys are different, you're not human beings. You would, you would, prob you would probably not re-elect me to the IEC. But that's okay, because I can get a job at a university then. <laughs> make, it, make a lot more money, maybe. Uh, but for the vulgar thinker, everything, as I said, is one-sided to the extreme. You cannot have identity and difference coexisting. The individual and the social are irreconcilable. The subjective and the objective exclude one another. When in reality, all of these interpenetrate each, each other. Reality is, is contradictory, and every concept inevitably transitions into its opposite. And contradiction is the mode of existence of matter. And identity and difference are no different. Yes, all things exist in huge varieties, and yet matter spontaneously organizes itself, organizes itself into similar patterns and similar processes. And it's precisely the task of science to discover this inner essence that transcends all of the different expressions of, of phenomena. Now, it's true that our ideas and our concepts are not, are not exact replica of the phenomena that we describe. They can only be an approximation of that. But, but they're an approximation that we constantly refine and test 
and therefore get closer and closer and closer without ever reaching that real concept, that, that real essence which exists. The concept of human, for instance, is a, is a relatively well-developed concept, and we find this highest expression in the fields of medicine, in history, anthropology, psychology, where different aspects of what it means to be human are, 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 are tested and, 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 how do you say it, discovered. And at the same time, this is where our ideas are carried out in practice. You know, every time a, a, a doctor, a surgeon opens you up and operates, <laughs> he's putting into practice the ideas that, that medicine has developed over thousands of years. And if there are any shortcomings, uh, this is in, the, in, in this place that they, of our ideas, this is where they will be corrected, discovered and corrected. But it's in this process, by, by, by uh, activity, by purpose of activity, that our ideas become objective and at the same time I eternally deepened uh, towards a closer and closer how do you say, understanding of the real essence of the things that we discover. Now, now that's the method of Marxism, but it's also the general path of human knowledge and human science. And it's a, it's, a, it's a supreme historic irony that the bourgeoisie, which rose to power on the basis of science, is now leaning on the most anti-scientific ideas. You see, the postmodernists go even further than this. They say that there are no, uh, there's no lawfulness or general patterns in, uh, in human history. And therefore, there's no progress either. Progress either. You know, one form of society is not better than the other. Or rather, is not more advanced than the other. In fact, however, I think they turn it around. Because if you read uh, people like Foucault and uh, the, the, some of the people in Frankfurt School, many, many, many of... Uh, postmodern writers, they go to great lengths to attack the Enlightenment, to attack the scientific revolution that, that, uh, that accompanied the rise of the bourgeoisie, while they paint a, a glorified picture of feudal society. And so while they won't admit it, ultimately, postmodernism is the glorification of backwardness and barbarism. And here we really begin to sense the, the reactionary nature of these ideas. Because while they glorify feudalism and, and all sorts of other ba backward uh, uh, societies, they take the most hostile approach towards socialism. They tr in fact, it's, it's, interesting, it's funny because these guys try to portray themselves as anti-establishment. But they are the exact opposite. They are through and through counter-revolutionary. And their real target is Marxism and communism. That is, the scientific outlook of Marxism and the struggle for, for a communist future. Because they, they don't just claim that it's futile to fight for a better future. They say that because Marxists do this, we are oppressive. They say that we are the enemy. And, they, and, and, because, and because we try to form a coherent understanding of the world, then we are dictatorial and authoritarians. They, they completely turn things upside down. Um, now... Today, postmodernism has become the preferred philosophy of the ruling class. At least, at least in the West, that's the case. And the reason is that um, the old uh, conservative ideas of the ruling class, they're a, very, they're, they're a bit difficult to sell nowadays. It's difficult to sell a, a philosophy that openly defends this system. Every, everyone is busy distancing themselves from it. Um, and therefore, postmodernism has become incredibly useful for the ruling class especially because it takes a starting point from an extremely confused but radical-sounding rhetoric. But it's our task as Marxists to cut through this, uh, this, uh, this fog, this reactionary fog, and to expose the reactionary nature. Because the aim of postmodernism is the same as the aims of the, of, the, of the Catholic Church and its old ideology, which is to divert the path of people, in particular young people today, so that they don't pose a danger for the system. That's the meaning of identity politics. That's the meaning of feminism, post-colonialism, queer theory, all of these things. Yes, on the surface, they can appear progressive. And the, and the majority of young people who gravitate towards these ideas do it for honest and progressive reasons. They want to fight against injustice and oppression and inequality, but they're deceived. And when we, because when we get closer to these, to these ideas, we see that their purpose is not just to downplay class differences, but they are, they are, they are extremely hostile towards a class approach, and they are hostile to anyone who raises the class question above their particular identity, 
and they viciously attack them. And I think some of you guys have experienced this in the, in the Palestine movement lately, where small cliques of activists have monopolized the movement and have, 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 have fought against any attempts to generalize it and, and give it a class character, which, which is why that movement was, su was suffocated. And so there you can see, if you don't have a conscious approach, you can f start from an honest uh, uh, wish to fight inequality and injustice, but you can inadvertently end up fighting for the preservation of the system. As if, if you want to quote uh, uh, Spinoza, as if you were fighting for your own deliverance. Now, the ruling class is fully aware of the role of postmodernism today. Uh, recent, a few years ago, there was a, a declassified docu CIA document from 1985. It was called uh, France, the Defection of Leftist Intellectuals. Now, the authors of this paper in, in, this, are, are gleefully describing the rise of postmodern ideas in, in French universities, and especially their attack on Marxism and communism. And they say this. They said, there is a new climate of intellectual opinion in France, a spirit of anti-Marxism and anti-Sovietism that will make it difficult for anyone to mobilize significant intellectual p opposition to U.S. policies. That's, isn't that clear? And they continue, led by a group of young renegade communist ranks who, who build themselves as, a new, as new philosophers, Many new intellectuals have rejected Marxism and developed deep-rooted antipathy towards the Soviet Union. Anti-Sovietism has in fact become the touchstone of legitimacy and left circles weakening the traditional anti-Americanism of the left intellectuals and allowing American culture and even economic and political policies to find new vogue. Now, this is, a, this is a very interesting report, and I really recommend people to read it in full. It has lots of interesting points in it. In, in fact, their analysis is very close to ours, just from an opposite class point of view. But, um, but since then, the, the, um, the, the different strains of postmodernism has been promoted throughout the world of academia. And it's, be, and it's become infused into the whole of the education system today to the point that it's now become a, 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 an ordinary part of everyday life. Now, just like the church once described itself as humble servants of God, m modern academia is often described as the neutral pursuit of knowledge. And, and there's no doubt that in academia, in particular at the lower levels, there are many people who honestly believe this. But there's equally no doubt that the education system as a whole is one of the key means for the preservation of, of, uh, of the ruling class, and it would never leave anything like the dominant ideas of this system uh, up to chance. And certain ideas and certain people are promoted uh, throughout this whole system. And so the same universities, which were the ground of anti-clericalism in previous times, have now taken up the role that the church itself has as making a case for the regime. Uh, the Marxists have seen, saw this right from the beginning. And Lenin, Lenin wrote in his uh, excellent article, um, what is it called? Uh, on militant materialism. He said, Dietzken Senior is uh, one of the first uh, Marxists, one of the first uh, generations of Marxists, Senior, correctly, aptly, and clearly expressed the, fun the fundamental view of the, of the philosophical trends which prevails in bourgeois countries and enjoy the regard of their scientists and publicists when he said that the professors of philosophy in modern society are in the majority of cases nothing but graduated flunkies of clericalism. Flunkies, servants. Yes, <clears throat> the role of, of, of modern academia is to dispel, the, 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 is to distribute the philosophy of the ruling class and assist in the subject, in keeping the working class subjugated under the jackboots of capitalism. And therefore, the struggle against these reactionary ideas are just as important for us as the other forms of struggle we carry out, if not more. Now, there is a caricature of communism sometimes, which is often repeated by communists themselves, that we, do not, we don't care about philosophy. You know, the communists are only about getting stuck in and strikes and movements and, and so on. And I've even heard that in our organization recently, quite a few times, that, um, you know, we used to be about theory, but now we're a fighting organization. Well, 
Now, comrades, this is an entirely false and dangerous notion from beginning to end. In fact, Marx and Engels started from philosophy. They started from the critique of bourgeois philosophy, and they never ended their philosophical uh, journey. And the same goes for all the other great Marxists. We're, we're having a year of Lenin. I hope, uh, I hope comrades have, uh, are reading or have read the Lenin book. But if you, if you look at Lenin's life, you find that the, the vast majority of it was fighting one theoretical struggle after another to educate and re-educate the Bolshevik party. And, and, uh, and what did he say about a fighting party? He said, without revolutionary theory, there can be no revolutionary movement. Because he realized, uh, as all the other great Marxists, that uh, you have three forms of struggle. You have the, uh, the, the, the proletarian fights on the economic plane and the political plane, but it must also fight on the political plane. Um, but it's not just... Uh, in, the, in the struggle against bourgeois ideas that this is important. A, a, a dialectical materialist philosophy is essential for the proletarian revolution, is an essential tool for revolution. You know, Alan, Alan explained yesterday that um, capitalism grew spontaneously from within uh, feudalism. If you look at the bourgeois revolutions in England, in the Netherlands, in France, or anywhere else, None of them were fighting for a capitalist society. <laughs> they were fighting in the name of uh, religion or in the name of, of democratic uh, notions. But unconsciously, they were bringing about, they were, they were sweeping away feudal society and bringing about capitalism. And they were, interest, they were representing the interests of the capitalist class. But, that was, uh, but, but socialism is not a spontaneous, unconscious process. But socialism requires the working class to consciously take power into its own hands. And in order to succeed, it must have the deepest understanding of the laws of society that it's fighting against. And in order to have that, it must, have, it must acquire the most advanced philosophy. Because you, see, because you see, ordinary consciousness is not sufficient to serve us with a full understanding of these deep going processes. For example, um, you know, I was at a... a, a, a social gathering recently, and there was a, there was a petty bourgeois talking to me, <laughs> and saying, well, um, we're all free individual men and women, living in a free society, and we can all choose to work who we want to work for. We can find an employer, we'll make a voluntary contract with him, we voluntarily agree a wage with him, and um, if you don't like the place that you work for, if you don't like your conditions or wages, you can go somewhere else, or you can choose not to work. Every one of those statements is true on the surface of things. But the whole point is to go beyond the surface. And, and then you see that everything will change. You might find a job that's better than the one you have now in this or that way. But in general, you're going to find that most jobs are more or less the same. The differences are marginal. And even though you, get, you maybe go to a place where they treat you slightly better, you will soon meet the same relentless pressure as in the previous one you left. To work to work harder for less wages. So, so in the end, you have no choice at all. In fact, for the majority of people in the world, it's not so easy to find a new job at all, which means that if you already have a, a, a job, you're left at the mercy of that boss who will keep pressuring you in order to extract more and more profit from you. And you might think that you, will, you can stop working altogether. No one will stand in your way. Of course, there's a slight problem because you might lose your livelihood you might end up living in the most barbaric conditions of abject po poverty, if you're lucky. You might choose to combine and organize with other workers and stop working and c demand better conditions. But the stronger your struggle is, the more you will see the full might of the state, the media and all of the establishment officialdom to be mobilized to crush you. And on the boss's side, it's, it's, uh, there is it's a similar process. He might think that he is entering into contract with you freely, but since he's in competition with other bosses, he needs the workers and he, he must offer them as little wage as possible. And he must, uh, he must push them further and further uh, in order to extract more profit from them. And, here, and here, we, here we see the difference between the superficial method of thinking and a deeper, more dialectical one. Because we start with a society of free individuals, but we go under the surface and we see a brutal regime where the worker is forced to work for a capitalist in the most degrading conditions 
And while it's true that there's no gun pointing at most workers' heads, you are forced to work under the threat of violence, the violence of, state of unemployment, the violence of homelessness, poverty, and so on. That's not freedom. That's slavery of the whole working class, or in other words, wage slavery. Um, now, in, and in the end, as Marx and Engels explained, what you have, the only freedom that exists, is the freedom of the capitalists to exploit the worker. And it's, this, and it's this contradiction which inevitably prepares the proletarian revolution. And this is, it's like this where we look at the whole of society. That, yeah, men and women are formally free to make their own choices in their lives. But as soon as we take a, a step back and take a bird's eye view, we, we immediately see iron laws operating in society, independently and often opposed to the will of millions and millions of people. The majority of people want a peaceful life, but in pursuit of a peaceful and harmonious life, this, this system puts insurmountable obstacle, obstacles in front of them. And therefore, exactly because people want a peaceful life, they become massively radicalized, and, and they draw the most revolutionary c conclusions. If you look at human history, the, the, the laws are even more striking. Before, en before anything else, human beings have to eat, sleep, and subsist themselves. And in order to do that, we develop means of production, tools to raise our productivity. At a certain stage in this process, a part of humanity doesn't have to work to sustain itself. <clears throat> it, it, can live, it can live off of the surplus value created by others. That's the rise of class society, which is driven by the struggle for the surplus value. And each, at each stage, the developments of the productive forces lead to enormous steps forward for humanity. Early class societies, for instance, coincided with the flowering of science and culture and philosophy. The height of that was in ancient Greece. But that mode of production, slavery, reached its, reached its apex in ancient Rome and buckled under its own con contradictions. And from the ruins of, of that, uh, uh, soci that uh, society came feudalism, which then outplayed its role and was overthrown by capitalism. And capitalism itself was a huge step forward for humanity. So, so an, uh, uh, um, how do you say, uh, an unprecedented development of the means of production, allowing us to pull all of humanity out of barbarism. But now that system itself has become uh, an obstacle for human progress and is preparing its own grave diggers in the working class. Now, all of these previous societies, is one ruling class has, has uh, replaced another, and each of them imposed their own property relations onto society. But the workers do not own property. That's their very nature. And therefore, a society, a, a, a working class revolution, must necessarily discard all private property altogether. And therefore, the proletarian is the only class that can pull humanity out of class society. So, so that humanity, for the first time, can master its own destiny. Now, for the, for the postmodernist, to acknowledge that society is lawful in the way that I described uh, means that he is trapped or that he will have to admit that he's trapped because it represents the end, the end of the road for his class and the class rule that he represents. But for the Marxists, the understanding of the lawfulness of society is a, is a source of the highest freedom. And it's only with, with Marxist philosophy that we can achieve this understanding. For us, freedom is, is recognizing this whole historical progress, process and to participate in it as conscious elements rather than unconscious ones. That, it, it's, that is what gives us an advantage over all others. And it, it's also what gives us the ability to dedicate our lives to this cause and make any sacrifice necessary to partake in the historical task of pushing humanity out of the dead end of a of, of barbaric class society and, and to pave the way for the true free development of human society. Thank you very much.
Well, thank you very much, Hamid, for that excellent uh, presentation. Um, yeah, I think we have, a pre we have enough time for at least one speaker before we uh, take a break. So yeah, the first speaker I have is uh, Jerome. Okay, um, our book on the history of philosophy, written by uh, Alan Woods, ends up with uh, Marxist philosophy. And some people might ask why there is not a chapter, or, or several chapters, on the history of philosophy since Marx. I think Hamid has made a point about this already, but, but after all, there's been, uh, there's been a lot of uh, philosophical schools and celebrities in the 20th century. There's been uh, postmodernism, of course, but before that, other schools. Yes, but from a Marxist point of view, none of these philosophical schools uh, represented an improvement uh, of philosophy. Not just postmodernism, but all of, these, all of these schools. As a matter of fact, they, marked, they, they represented a profound regression, not only compared to Marxist philosophy, but also compared to the, to the great thinkers before Marx, and especially the, the great thinkers that expressed the philosophical outlook of the rising bourgeoisie. Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Locke, the French materialist of the 18th century, uh, Kant, and of course uh, Hegel, among uh, others. Uh, these philosophers had, had very different doctrines from one to each other. Some were idealists, others were materialists. Some were monists, they believed in on, there was only one substance. Or they were dualists, that is, they, they, think, they thought that matter and thinking were two separate substances, distinct substances, independent from each other. But all of these, uh, all of these philosophers had, an, had, a very, had something in common. They had a very optimistic outlook. They believed in the progress of science, of knowledge, and culture. And this uh, expressed the, the progressist and, uh, um, outlook of the bourgeoisie itself, which at, which at that time was playing a, a revolutionary role, progressist role, or, or, or was a revolutionary class. And by the way, Hamid said that the, the Marxist uh, philosophy is a continuation of the, t of the teaching of the great thinkers of that, uh, uh, of the great representative of bourgeois philosophy. Yes, but, but Marxist philosophy also marked a, a turning point and a, a, a qualitative change in the history of philosophy. Dialectical materialism does not represent the outlook of the bourgeoisie. It is a revolutionary philosophy directed, directed against the power of the bourgeoisie, which from being a revolutionary class has transformed itself, itself into a reactionary class. At that stage, the, the bourgeois philosophy started, started to degenerate rapidly which reflected its uh, hostility toward Marxism, but more generally, uh, um, uh, but generally uh, it reflected a, um, a pessimistic outlook and ne an, an increasingly skeptical attitude towards the progress of knowledge and the rejection of generalizations. Take, for example, the so-called uh, school of phenomenology. Not to be confused with uh, the great uh, book by Hegel called uh, Phenomenology of Spirit. Phenomenology is a school which emerged at the beginning of the 20th century and, uh, at, and had a big and uh, lasting impact on uh, philosophy in France, Germany, and other places. You, you might have crossed the names of uh, Husserl and then Heidegger. The slogan of this school, the, the, the main slogan of this school was, back to the things themselves. Well, it's a bit vague, but so far so good, right? But then they say, in order, in order to develop a solid philosophical knowledge about the things themselves, we must look at them and study them as if the world did not exist outside our mind and independently of our mind, which becomes suspicious. Well, they do not, they do not or they pretend, they pretend they do not deny or, or even put it in doubt the existence of the objective uh, reality outside of our mind. But they pretend that by looking uh, uh, at the world as if he had no independent existence, that is independent of our, our, our mind, by, doing the, by applying this method, we avoid the dangerous temptation of discover, discovering the lawfulness of the world, the, the existence of laws. Because they see this, they see this as a danger, as prejudices. According to them, we must not study the world with the purpose of understanding the laws governing the world. No, they say we must look at the world as 
it, uh, like they say in the terminology, as it is given to us. What is the consequence of, of this silly method? The consequence is that phenomenology is content with a pure description of uh, uh, the surface of reality. It is, if you want, an extreme form of empiricism based on pure intuitions of the, of the word, intuition, based on intuition, as opposed to the scientific method that looks be beneath the surface of things, goes beyond the, the realm of, of pure intuition to discover the laws governing the objective reality. So phen phenomenology is a philosophy, at the end of the day, it's a philosophy of passivity, of pure contemplation, and of methodic ignorance. As such, it represents a regression not only compared to the Marxist, philo to Marxist philosophy, but also compared to the great thinkers of the 16th, 17th, and, and uh, 18th century. It ends up being an, a very in individualistic philosophy also. They, they, they sum up everything to the relationship between me and the world. There is no collective thinking of act or action. It's, a, it's another form of uh, subjective idealism, really, but uh, a shameful one. They, they don't pretend to be, but that's what it is at the end of the day. And the, same, and the same thing can be said about all the other schools of the bourgeois philosophy of the 20th century. Existentialism, logical positivism, postmodernism, etc. And the fundamental reason for that is the impasse of capitalism itself, which, which manifests manifest itself in the prof, profound crisis of bourgeois culture. To sum up, Marxist philosophy is neither contemplative nor passive. It is a philosophy full of confidence in the development of human knowledge and culture. A philosophy that rejects uh, firmly all the theories that fix an absolute limit to the development of knowledge and culture. A philosophy that not only helps to understand the, the objective world uh, deeper and deeper, but which is a decisive tool in our hands in the revolution, revolutionary struggle to transform society from top to bottom. Yes. Okay, comrades, before we go on, a, on the break, I have a couple of things to announce. Uh, first, if you are inspired by this presentation and discussion so far, uh, and you really want to dive deep into philosophy, you are in luck. Uh, the International has produced a lot of great books lately on philosophy, most notably The History of Philosophy by Alan Woods, as Jerome mentioned, which, which if you have not read, you absolutely must read. And you can get, you can get copies at the, at the bookstall, well-read bookstall at the back. Or for those of you listening online at wellreadbooks.com. Uh, uh, as well, uh, I've been told to recommend this book, A Reason and Revolt. Uh, which is, yeah, uh, investigates the relationship between Marxist philosophy and science. Um, yeah, which is, which is a fantastic book. If you have not read it already, I encourage you to get that as well. So we have a lot of people who want to intervene. Our first person we have is Vincent, followed by Jack. But I, yeah, I really ask, I plead <laughs> for every person intervening to keep it to maximum 15 minutes, including translation. And, and if what you said has already been talked about, please take yourself off the list. Uh, so yeah, we'll start with Vincent. Hello, comrades. So Marxism has been fighting one form of another of uh, subjectivist uh, idealism for a while. Whether it's been the fight of Marx against and Engels against Kantism, or Lenin against imperial criticism, or us now against postmodernism and identity politics. If there is an unbroken thread from Marx uh, till us. The subjectivists also have some kind of uh, unbroken or maybe broken thread that can be traced back to Kant, Immanuel Kant. Kant has elaborated uh, the philosophical foundation of all this tradition. He built a theory to explain that we cannot know the world as it exists independently from uh, the, the knowing subject. He starts with a good point of departure that the act of knowledge is not passive, but active. We don't only do a list of things, but consciously we select, we organize, and we interpret information coming from the things that we see. We understand the world through what Kant called the categories. It's the most general concepts, like time and space, necessity and accident, causality, existence and non-existence. But from this, Kant draws the wrong conclusion. 
He says that we cannot know if these, these logical categories exist outside of our mind. All that we can know is that our mind works with these categories. He says that these categories would be the very forms of our mind, the different ways uh, through which our reason is structured. For example, for him, our mind is structured to see things through, through space and time, and thus this is the reason why we can say that things exist in time and space. But we cannot know if time and space exist outside of our mind. For him, we are imposing our categories of time and space on reality, like projections of our mind. It's like if we were seeing the world through a filter, a filter that we can't remove, a filter that prevents us from seeing the things at is, as they, they are uh, really outside of our mind. We, we can make an analogy with our glasses. My glasses are a filter between me and the world. Personally, I'm quite glad to have this filter. Otherwise, I, will, I would surely collide with the world. But can't say that uh, our glasses prevents us from seeing the world at, as it is really. Because of our glasses, the world uh, as it exists objectively is inaccessible. And this is really absurd. Ultimately, with Kant, it's not the object that oblige the subject to conform to its rules, but it's the subject that imposes its own rules on the subject he wants to know. It's the ideas of the mind that organizes the material world. The mind creates reality. And there is something really ironic with Kant. His project wa was to, uh, to, get, uh, to, to, to make philosophy more scientific. He wanted to rid philosophy of its metaphysical presuppositions, like we had with the philosophies of Plato and Christianity, who invented magical and divine world filled with angels and supernatural forces. But in reality, what Kant did is to destroy the basis of science. Because our concept uh, allowing us to understand the world, instead of being a bridge to objective reality, as they should be, with Kant, these concepts become a barrier uh, sep separating us from the world. Because of his agnostic uh, outlook, Kant, Kant has given up on understanding the world. And the only knowledge that is really certain is, is the knowledge of our own mind. He therefore theorized the rejection of science. When we ask Kant where does our mental categories come from, he tells us that we are born with them. It's a gift from God. But what Hegel and Marx would show us is that, on the contrary, our categories uh, don't come primarily from our mind, but from the exterior world. The young child will learn to understand the world by touching the object and putting them in, the, in his mouth. And in this way, he will learn the laws of causality, of gravity, of time and space. The laws of universe, the objective laws, are thus transposed into the mind of the young kid. Through practical experience, by transforming the world around us, we acquire the, ca the logical categories to understand the world. We learn to understand the world more intimately. We get closer to the, the knowledge of the objectivity. Marx said that the movement of the thought is only the reflection of the real movement transported and transposed into the brain of man. Lenin called this the theory of reflection, and this is the basis for the Marxist theory of knowledge, that our ideas of a, a, are a reflection, more or less imperfect, of the relationships and processes that exist in the exterior world. And we need the, to recognize that the specter of Kant, the ghost of Kant, is still haunting the corridors of the universities. His philosophy is at the heart, the heart of uh, theories and identity politics that came from postmodernism and which dominate the left, like intersectionality and queer theory, like the theory of settler colonialism and the critical race theory. But these theories go further that, than what Kant said. They go further into relativistic degeneration because Kant uh, thought that we could all agree on some common knowledges. Because we were all uh, sharing the same categories, we all have the same glasses, so we could 
have a, a basis, uh, we can share a, a common knowledge of these glasses. But for uh, postmodernism, each social group, each oppressed group has his own glasses. Even each individual has his own glasses. So we can't agree anymore on common knowledge. For the postmodernist, Kant's categories become the discourse. Each identity group has its own discourse to understand the world, to see the world. So we can't no longer understand the world as it exists independently of our discourses. But more than that, each discourse of each social group is creating the reality for each of these groups. For example, the white cis male produces patriarchal and white supremacist discourse, and this creates sexism, colonialism, imperialism, racism. So for the postmodern, there's, a, there's only subjective experience, point of views, point of views that only this group can understand. We must reject all theories that is too much uh, all-encompassing or too systematic, because that would do violence to the subjective experience and, and these ideas are profoundly anti-scientific. It's giving up on being able to understand the world. And if we can't change, if we can't understand the world, we can't change it. And we stay oppressed and exploited. That's why these ideas are really useful for the ruling class. And this is why the philosophy of Marxism is so important for us. Because it allows us to change the objective reality and liberate, it, and liberate us. Okay, thank you, Vincent. Uh, the next speaker we have is Jack, followed by Ubaldo. Hello, comrades. Uh, in his philosophical notebooks, Lenin explains that dialectics are mo more than just a logical method. They also offer a theory of knowledge. Dialectics is the key to understanding cognition, to understanding how we acquire a truthful understanding of the world. And key to this process is abstraction. An incorrect approach to abstraction is one of the fundamental causes of sectarian errors. Lenin explains that abstraction is an active dialectical process. For example, abstraction involves splitting the appearance of a thing from its essence, from its essence, yeah. We strip away accidental factors to uncover the necessity and lawfulness of a given process. On this question, Lenin reminds us of the great advance that Hegel made on the theory of knowledge. Until Hegel, philosophers argued over whether our understanding of the world is based upon appearance or essence. Hegel, however, uncovered that we need both appearance and essence. And this was a philosophical revolution. And this allows us to understand why Lenin said two seemingly contradictory things. He says, on one hand, that abstractions are more true than simple facts. On the other hand, however, he insists that the truth is always concrete. So the truth is both abstract and concrete. This is a contradiction a dialectical contradiction. Here we can see that truthful knowledge is not static and fixed for all eternity. Cognition is a dialectical process of endless successive approximation. We move from the concrete to the abstract and back to the concrete, and so on. Once we arrive at a correct generalization about the world, we cannot be satisfied, we cannot call it a day. It must be continually refined and compared against an infinitely varied and complex reality. There will be countless secondary tendencies that contradict our generalizations. New facts, new forms, new processes, and importantly, shifts in consciousness. And in the class struggle, these things can be decisive. So a Marxist organization must refine its generalizations through practice. Lenin explains this. He says, the unity of the theoretical idea and of prax practice equals the objective idea. The test of our perspectives and slogans is their ability to orient ourselves to events, to connect with the working class, and to build the party, or the international. <laughs> a correct position or a correct tactic can become falsified over time. This can also happen very quickly. For example, Lenin was prepared to tear up the old program of the Bolsheviks in 1917. In the April theses, the program of democratic dictatorship was replaced with the program of socialist revolution. This doesn't mean the old program was always incorrect, but its limits came into conflict with a new situation. It had to be cast aside. And it's no coincidence that Lenin, a dialectician who studied Hegel, was the only person prepared to do this. 
But not every change in perspectives or tactics needs to come about suddenly or drastically. Small corrections and changes in emphasis are equally important to reach the masses. For example, we have deepened and developed our understanding of the mass workers' organizations and the entryist tactic. Our tendency made a generalization that the masses moved through the traditional mass organizations. But new facts have emerged. We've had the hollowing out of the old social democratic and Stalinist parties, the experience of the bankruptcy of left reformism, and also the labor bureaucracy are determined to never let something like Corbyn, the Corbyn movement, happen again. So the old abstraction is still generally true, but we've deepened it and clarified it through practice. And if we'd clung to the old abstractions, we wouldn't have been able to make this bold new turn in our work. Now, the sectarians, they raise a hue and cry about this. They demand a formal apology or an explanation for our previous slogans and methods. <laughs> and this is because sectarians live in a world of ready-made formulas. They fetishize abstraction. They raise it above reality. This is what we call formalism. And when reality crushes their abstractions beyond repair, they often somersault in the direction of empiricism and impressionism, which means slavishly worshiping the immediate present. And this is one reason why sectarians zigzag between ultra-leftism and opportunism. The philosophical basis of this is the zigzagging between formalism and empiricism. And these are two sides of the same deficiency, an inability to grasp reality dialectically. So, sectarianism is above all a question of philosophical method. It's not a question of secondary things like how we orient towards the mass organizations. Now, we are not a sectarian organization, obviously, but formalism and empiricism can creep in, as they sometimes did in the Bolshevik party. So there is only one safeguard from sectarian errors, to apply the dialectical method as part of the living struggle. Marx said, famously, that the philosophers are only interpreted the world, the point, however, is to change it. And I would add that we can only interpret the world correctly by fighting to change it. Now, Hamid mentioned this idea that we're, uh, this incorrect idea, that we are no longer concerned with theory, that we are now a fighting organization. I would say it's especially because we are now a fighting organization that we pay even more attention to theoretical clarification. Thank you. Thank you. That was excellent. It was only 10 minutes. Uh, so, yeah, next speaker we have is Ubaldo, followed by Ellen. Buenas uh, tardes. Good afternoon. Well, good morning. Postmodernism is especially in vogue uh, also in the universities in Latin America. Como bien lo dijo Hamid, exaltan sentimientos que son muy arraigados, que tienen un profundo eco en la... As Hamid mentioned, they uh, raise all of these feelings that are, are very deeply rooted in the youth uh, and that have a, a certain truth to them. Sin embargo, lejos de hacerlo para buscar una alternativa para terminar con esos sentimientos de acción, de acción... But instead of doing this to actually find a real scientific solution to all of these problems of exploitation, of oppression... Lo hacen de una forma moral, eh, quejándose, eh, remarcando la, el sufrimiento de eh, pueblos. They instead turn it into a moral question, uh, crying and just uh, falling back on themselves about the uh, sad situation of these peoples. Tienen tanto impacto que los camaradas afirman no logramos organizar uh, they have such an effect that even some of uh, the comrades in, uh, that are in our universities, uh, they basically say that if they don't have uh, a way to uh, bring these comrades, bring these new contacts into the organization, if, if these ideas are not uh, rescued uh, in the first few months, then they are going, these new contacts are going to be lost. Uh, these thinkers like Derrida and Foucault, they are the daily bread of all of these uh, tendencies in schools. They have a very uh, particular name for this thing, uh, they call it de decolonization, post-colonialism. 
Y su máxima virtud es que han amasado todos los prejuicios y todas las teorías más And the most that they can say for themselves is that they have really amassed all of the prejudices and all of the wrongs of all of these different tendencies into one single uh, tendency. Y aunque aseguran eh, que el pensamiento es nuevo, que no viene de ninguna fuente europea, porque and even though they affirm that their thinking is new because they are not European and that they are coming from an, an oppressed uh, part of the world and therefore they're not exploiters, they uh, rescue, for example, from Derrida this question of the centralization of the center que básicamente lo que plantean es crear nuevas, nuevas filosofías eh, creadas desde la periferia. That basically assert that new philosophies should be created uh, on the periphery. Crean de manera abstracta dos grandes polos, el norte global y el sur global. So they create uh, two big poles around the world, the uh, north side of the world, the northern hemisphere and the global south. Donde todo lo que sale del sur es progresista y revolucionario. And they say that everything that comes out of the global south is progressive and, of course, revolutionary. También, basado en esta idea, eh, plantean la cuestión de apoyar eh, y construir una nueva, una nueva historia e identidad de los subalternos. And from this, they pose the theory of creating a new reality uh, from coming from those oppressed uh, or uh, the lowest rungs of society. De esta forma tenemos que rechazar todas las teorías, se le llaman totalizantes o generalizantes. And therefore we have to reject all ideas that are totalizing or generalizing. Porque esta no reflejan el de los ejemplos. Because these don't reflect the thinking uh, or the feelings of, for example, indigenous people. Y simplemente echan a la basura el método científico. And they simply toss the scientific method into the trash. ¿Cómo estudiar la historia? Uh, of how to really study history that Marxism gives us. This is instead replaced by the discourses of the most oppressed rungs of society. Uh, those of us that live uh, among and know the ways that uh, these uh, certain sectors of society think, know that this thinking is uh, a type of tokenism and is actually very simplifying to the brutality and exploitation that these sectors uh, of society have faced, uh, the, po the indigenous populations. De Foucault rescatan eh, que todas las relaciones son relaciones de poder. From Foucault, what they bring out of that is that all relations are power relations. Como uno mismo es parte de esta relación de poder, no se da cuenta que lo ejerce. And because one is already a part of this web of power, he doesn't realize, uh, one doesn't realize when oneself is actually enforcing these power relations onto others. Así no te puedes dar cuenta cómo construyes una verdad a partir de la, del poder. And therefore, you aren't really able to be aware of how you are constructing uh, an, a truth that is based on power. Por tanto, toda verdad es relativa. Uh, therefore, all truth is relative. Todo conocimiento es relativo. All knowledge is relative. Y todo re razonamiento. And all reasoning es is y also relative and uh, oppressive. Foucault se niega a aplicar cómo Fou llega a sus... Foucault uh, rejects actually explaining how he reaches his, his conclusions. Porque dice que todo razón un trasfondo detrás. Because he says that all, all theories, all ways of thinking actually have a, a base to them and that is basically imposing your own way of thinking onto the of everyone else. And therefore you don't actually have to give reasons about why you arrived at your conclusions. Uh, all you have to do is say them and that's it. Los de coloniales llevan esta idea a plantear que todo lo que viene de Europa es eh, malo. Uh, the postcolonialists say that uh, they have this idea that everything that comes from Europe is bad. Tienen una batalla contra la modernidad que básicamente la relacionan con todo el pensamiento de la ilustración. They are fighting uh, against modernity. They have this ongoing battle against modernity that they relate to uh, the Enlightenment. No se ponen a pensar eh, ni un momento, eh, en realidad lo que significó 
la lucha de la ilusión contra el oscurantismo religioso. But they never really stopped to think about what it really meant, what the uh, what the enlightenment really meant, and it, it's a fight against obscurantism. Y yo estoy seguro que ni siquiera conocen de escritores, por ejemplo, eh, como Diderot, que llama a la insurrección. Uh, and I'm quite sure that they haven't actually bothered to pick up uh, any of these books. I'm quite sure that they haven't bothered to pick up uh, the readings of uh, Diderot, who actually uh, calls for uh, colonial insurrections against their ruling classes. They reject the ideas of modernity because they say that these ideas uh, have justified the oppression of the indigenous peoples. Pero se les olvida un poco que antes las ideas de la ilusión ya había de pueblos de colonia. Dentro de ellos los el aztecas tuvieron control militar despiadado contra uh, otros. But what they neglect to mention is that even before the Enlightenment, there was already uh, a subjugation and a colonization of other peoples. For example, in the Aztec uh, Empire, there was a massive subjugation of the, uh, from the Aztecs to all of the surrounding peoples. Logically, they uh, hate Marxism because Marxism is a set of ideas that is uh, white and European. Uh, they say that uh, Marxism is too linear in its way of thinking about progress and about society. That that is not the way that uh, Latin America actually developed. And they reject uh, Marxist ideas because they say that they are totalizing and that they uh, reject the points of view of the oppressed uh, and of the exploited of Latin America. El marxismo tiene una visión reduccionista al basar la acción económica eh, el dominio cultural. They say that Marxism is economically reductionist and that it doesn't actually take into account uh, cultural uh, dominion and cultural oppression. Y que no comprende la relación interna entre la cultura y la nación. And that it doesn't understand the, uh, the internal relation between culture and nature. Proyecto Pico es el siguiente. Therefore, their political project is as follows. Tenemos que cambiar el lenguaje y la mentalidad. We have to change language, we have to change ways of thinking. Como este es un proyecto largo. Because uh, this project is quite a long and len lengthy project. Tal vez a 200 años. Maybe in, uh, we can do this in 200 or 300 years. Lo que tenemos que apoyar ahora es lo nativo. But what we have to support right now is that which is native. Los que respetan la voz de los subalternos. Uh, those who rescue the voices of the oppressed. Por ejemplo, proyectos como el de, el de perdón, Evo, Moral, Evo Morales, que era un gobierno indígena. For example, uh, projects such as uh, the government of Evo Morales, which was uh, uh, an indigenous government. O López Obrador, que organiza seminarios que vienen de subalternos. O uh, López Obrador, que tiene seminarios uh, directos a los uh, uh, oppressed layers. Es decir, en términos prácticos, lo que hace el reformista. Uh, so, en practical terms, what this means is that the uh, conclusions are entirely reformist. Y la forma de acabar o de combatirnos. And the way that they fight against us, Marxists. No es que lo tienen bases eh, que se puedan soportar. They don't actually fight against us philosophically because they don't have a base on which to stand. And so all that they say about us is that we are colonized, that we are uh, the colonizers, and that in our mind we are thinking like a white man. Uh, we should have absolutely no mercy in the ideological battle against these types of people. Thank you, Baldo. The next speaker will be Alain, followed by Khaled. As Marx explained, the ideas of a society are the ideas, the ruling ideas of a society are the ideas of, of the ruling class. And so the class struggle is also a struggle for philosophical ideas. We saw this clearly in Russia, where the process of counter-revolution after the 1905 revolution was also brought into the sphere of ideas. The revolution ended in a great defeat, 
with a reactionary period for some years to follow. And this defeat had a profoundly demoralizing effect, especially on those intellectuals who had sympathized with the revolution when it, when it was in full swing, but who began to abandon it as soon as the re reaction came. A feeling of pessimism invaded the petty bourgeoisie with a tendency to abandon class struggle and turn inward, seeking out new ideas, including irrational religious and semi-religious ones. And it was around that time that imperial criticism, a subjective, idealistic, uh, philosophical trend, influenced mainly by the neo-positivist ideas of uh, Ernst Mach, the Austrian physicist, and um, of the German-Swiss uh, philosopher Richard Avenarius. So those ideas became very popular among a layer of the Russian intelligentsia. It really corresponded to the prevailing mood of depression, pessimism, and mysticism. And these alien class ideas also penetrated the ranks of the Bolshevik. Between 1906 and 1908, a, a series of books and articles were published, written in particular uh, by certain Mensheviks and socialist revolutionaries, but also by Bolsheviks, such as Alexander Bogdanov and Anatoly Lunacharsky. Essentially, what they were claiming is that Marxism was kind of an outdated philosophy that needed updating and revision in the light of the so-called new ideas of imperial criticism. And it, it was in this context that Lenin made a, a, a very important contribution to Marxist philosophy in, in the 1908 book, uh, Materialism versus Imperial Criticism, that you can buy just right there, in which he meticulously criticized these ideas. So, imperial criticism claims to go beyond the division between materialism and idealism by um, abolishing the fundamental distinction between, on one hand, what belongs to psychology, the, to the thinking subject, and on the other end, what belongs to the physical, objective world. So this philosophy then reduced everything to experience with the object of the world described as complexes of sensation. And on this basis, uh, the Russian uh, imperial critics, they reject materialism because they consider that it, it postulates that there is a material world beyond our experience and a world beyond our sensation, and that is a phantasmatic abstraction. To which uh, we can reply, as Lenin did, but where do our sensations come from? Where do our senses come from? Where does our consciousness, which experiences sensation through our senses, where does it come from? And if everything is experience, what are we experiencing? We must be experiencing something other than the experience itself. And Lenin will go further. If, experience is, uh, is, if, if everything is experience, did the world exist before humans or any form of life existed and could observe the world uh, experience? <laughs> Which brings us to the question, where did human beings come from? Where does life come from? So obviously the imperial criticists didn't have any answer to those questions. So to say that the foundation of everything is experience and stop there um, is actually to say nothing at all. It, way, it raises way more questions than it gives answers. And this is why Lenin explained, uh, argued actually that this philosophy inevitably lead to religion, to mystical, irrational explanation. So it doesn't go beyond materialism and idealism. It stays profoundly idealist. And what, what Lenin explained, what we explain, is that the organic matter evolved naturally from inorganic matter. And eventually the further development of the central nervous system generated a brain, and eventually human brain and human consciousness. We are ultimately matter that has become conscious of itself. The objective world exists, yes, independently of the subject who experiences it, but the two are part of a dialectical unity. So Lenin waged a, a war against those ideas, against this subjective idealism, and he uses um, Engel's expression um, of an eclectic pauper's broth. Uh, he uses the, the expression of, of Engel's of an uh, eclectic pauper's broth, kind of a 
mix. Um, to describe the philosophy of those who tried to renew and combine Marxism with all sorts of idealist, idealistic ideas. And this is something we see and we have seen uh, <laughs> again today. You know, you meet sometimes intellectual, intellectuals who claim to be neo-Marxist, heterodox Marxist, analytical Marxist, queer Marxist. I saw on Wikipedia open Marxism. Don't ask me what it is. <laughs> the thing is that um, no matter how you try to modify Marxist philosophy, it will always come back to the same thing. You end up removing materialism from Marxism, you end up removing dialectical from, dialectics from, from Marxism, and so you end up removing Marxism from Marxism. Why is that? Because Marxism is, is not just a patchwork of good ideas and programmatic items. It is a coherent whole that can only be understood as such. You can't detach the uh, historical, economic, political analysis of materialism from the materialistic method. Everything starts with matter. When we say that the history of every society uh, is the history of class struggle, it comes from the scientific understanding that uh, there are objective material forces that shape society independently of our own subjectivity. But by rejecting materialism, even just the slightest bit of materialism, you reject uh, the objective scientific explanation of society. And this is precisely what the Bolshevik Bogdanov will end up doing. <clears throat> so I read this book on imperial monism, so you don't have two, fortunately. Uh, and he says at one point, laws are not given in experience, but are created by thought as a mean of organizing experience. This is almost identical to what we hear today from postmodern intellectuals. It was, there's nothing new under the sun. <laughs> but guess what? In Lenin's time, those ideas were not new at all. They were simply a rehash of uh, uh, the ideas of uh, David Hume and of Bishop Berkeley. Uh, Berkeley who said, uh, esse es percipi, uh, to be is to be perceived. So if laws are created by the mind, then they have nothing to do with material uh, reality. So if, is gravity only in my, my head? Natural selection in my mind? What about the laws of capital? It's, it, it, is Marx's uh, analysis of capitalism true? Does it correspond to reality? Or is it just a way of organizing our experience? If so, perhaps there's another way of organizing our experience. Um, uh, nothing justifies to fight uh, to end exploitation if it's not a material reality. So we can really see the reactionary consequences of this idealism. After almost two years of internal struggle with, within the Bolshevik ranks, in 1909, Lenin split from Bogdanov, Lunacharsky and company, and so on. But really, we, we must see here that Lenin's struggle was not only against their philosophical revisionism, it was against their formalism and ultra-leftism. Because obviously, political differences are linked to, to philosophical differences. To, to give an example of the political repercussion of this, on, under Bogdanov's uh, influence, the Petrograd Bolshevik adopted a, resolu a resolution in October 1905, calling on the, the Petrograd Soviet to recognize the Bolshevik leadership, and if they refuse, they should leave the Soviet. Unsurprisingly, no one listened to the Bolshevik or remained mainly isolated from the movement. And shortly, Lenin arrived from abroad, furious, and he said, you cannot, by means of ultimatum, force the masses to skip the necessary phase of their own political development. You really see here Lenin's materialism versus Bogdanov's idealism. You really see Lenin's flexible dialectical approach, which started from the workers' consciousness and then developed the right strategy, methods, and slogan to patiently connect with the masses and help them evolve toward revolutionary conclusions. And it's precisely this, this flexible, dialectical, patient approach, approach that um, Lenin brought into the Bolshevik party that ultimately uh, enabled the party to win the majority in the Soviets. So what this shows is that the basis for revolutionary action is to have a philosophical method that is precisely revolutionary. This means that we can't concede 
just even an inch to idealism. If Lenin had fought for that 10 years before the revolution, there's, uh, uh, we can be doubtful, actually, that the Bolshevik would have led the masses to victory. So this is why it's not just a theoretical debate. It is our duty as Marxists to reject and fight against such reactionary idealist nonsense and to defend the rational thought of dialectical materialism. Thank you, Alain. Uh, next, I have Khaled, followed by Sandor. Thank you. Khaled from the British section. Okay. Well, comrades, the human nature argument is often thrown in our faces as communists by those who seek to justify the status quo and say that society resembles our human essence. The dominant ideas of the ruling class say that we are atomized individuals who cannot be united because of our innate greediness or self-interest. And as Hamid explained, this divisive logic is used by the postmodernists. It's the exact same, uh, even though they pose as radicals. But Marxism provides us with the tools to dismantle these lies. In fact, even before Marx, Hegel wrote a witty article titled, Who Thinks Abstractly? Which shows the limits of this rigid and static view of human nature. He recounts a story of a murderer's execution. And to the authorities' dismay, there is great public sympathy towards the man who is going to be executed. The women in the square describe him as handsome and question what his family history was. To which the authorities reply, he is a murderer, plain and simple. Hegel then argues, for those wanting to understand the mind of the murderer, you must look at the material conditions that produced him. You must look at his history and why he became embittered against the status quo. And so Hegel characterizes the condemnation of the authorities as barren and abstract. To see nothing in the murderer except this fact is to annul him of all other human qualities. And Hegel pours scorn on this kind of thinking. He says it explains precisely nothing. Just as we pour scorn on those who say that greed explains our current predicament. We understand that capitalism creates individuals in its own image, promoting certain ideas of fulfillment and success. But despite all of the attempts to atomize us, the fact that we are social animals cannot be denied. We depend on one another, and it is collectively through labor that we evolved as a species. This is what our method teaches us. And the working class is welded together by its relation to the means of production, not by some arbitrary wish that we have invented. It, it was Marx who profoundly and beautifully explained human nature. He said it was the ensemble of social relations. Looking at humans as isolated individuals, rather than the relations between ourselves and the natural world, explains nothing at all. Society is clearly one of the causes behind our thoughts, the main cause. Our worries, our anxieties, our desires are to be found in the outside world. Our nature, therefore, is not an abstraction inherent in every individual. It is not fixed and static. Greed was not superimposed on humanity by a higher power. In fact, the abstractness of this position makes each individual identical and a mystery as to where our nature comes from. It opens the door to idealism and religious explanation. And you find a kernel of this in biological reductionism. I'm sure everyone has heard of the selfish gene. As far as I can tell, they haven't found this gene yet. But it's clear that this vulgar biology serves to justify the status quo. And in fact, with Marx, the dialectical view uh, of our relationship to one another and to nature is inherently revolutionary. Marxist philosophy, unlike all those philosophies before him, allows us to comprehend action, both past and present. The ideas that people have felt for a certain time consciousness being a reflection of social conditions. And as he writes in The Poverty of Philosophy, all history is nothing but the continuous transformation of human nature. 
When applied to history, we can understand the dominant ideas of antiquity, which justified the setup of society by saying that slaves have no souls, and we can understand the, the dominant ideas of modern-day capitalism, which justifies wage slavery through various means. Marxist philosophy makes it clear that there is nothing natural about greed. But Marxist philosophy goes further than this. If we want to fight greed, we have to change the way society is set up. And in this way, Marxist philosophy is not uh, a contemplative thing. It is a call to action. It is a call to socialist revolution for us to establish a higher form of society fit for human beings. And these conclusions that are being drawn across the world pose a mortal threat to the capitalist system. And this is why the bourgeois and their academic lackeys will never forgive Marx for his revolutionary philosophy. Thank you, Khaled. Uh, we have Sandor followed by Jordi. Um, in materialism and imperial criticism, uh, Lenin riots. Not a single one of these professors who are capable of making very valuable contributions in the special fields of chemistry, history, or physics can be trusted one iota when it comes to, philo when it comes to philosophy. Why? For the same reason that not a single professor of political economy who may be capable of very valuable contributions in his field, can be trusted one iota when it comes to the general theory of political economy. For in the modern society, the latter is as much as a partisan science as is epistemology. Taken as a whole, the professors of economics are nothing but learned salesmen of the capitalist class, while the professors of philosophy are learned salesmen of the theologians. Yeah, so what does uh, Lenin mean when he says that uh, the professors of philosophy are learned salesmen of the theologians? He means that they peddle religion in a disguised form. And I think uh, it's important to understand how this was meant, but because this applies even to those philosophers who may call themselves atheists if they adhere to idealism. We, we've heard it explained how there are two big tendencies in philosophy, right? Materialism which explains that the world is composed of matter which is eternal and infinite and in permanent change, and that this matter produces consciousness. And then we have idealism, which states that consciousness determines matter, or which sometimes even entirely denies that anything other th than consciousness even exists. The earliest form of idealism is religion, and it's important to understand that all the varieties of idealism, from religion to postmodernism, are equally oppressive, equally backwards, equally manifestations of ignorance and helplessness. Um, yes, Marxism explains that history is made by men and women. Religion and postmodernism claim that history happens independently of the actions of men and women, either by saying that history unfolds according to God's plan or by saying that human beings cannot access objective reality much less influence it in a conscious way. Human beings cannot access objective reality, much less influence it in a conscious way. In every variety of idealism, human beings end up at the mercy of uncontrollable higher forces. So idealism of all kinds fundamentally puts people in a position of helplessness and passivity. And consequently, a university course on queer theory or any other kind of postmodernist nonsense is not very different from a seminar of Catholic theology. So Hegel said that freedom is inside into necessity. <laughs> Humanity gained the freedom to fly by gaining insight into the objective laws of gravity and aerodynamics. We gained freedom from medical problems, a degree of freedom from medical problems by gaining insight into the nature of bacterial infection. So the meaning of freedom is that we can master the, law, the laws of objective reality. But the attitude of postmodernism, that as Hamid said, all we can do is make up stuff about stuff, keeps us enslaved to this reality, keeps us enslaved to, to the barbarism of capitalist society. And this is why these people have completely given up on the very idea of changing society. Foucault, Butler, Zizek, Judith Butler, None of them have a political program, and that is why their pretensions of being radical or subversive must be regarded as stupidity at best and malicious, cynical deception at worst. 
I think the latter option comes closer to the truth. Ted Grant, the founder of a movement, said that Marxism is the science of perspectives. Trotsky said that Marxism is the doctrine that shows what was, what is, and what is to come, and what is to be done. And our dialectical philosophy is the core of this science, and its superiority can be easily demonstrated by looking at our perspectives or at the manifesto of the RCI. The smartest representatives of the bourgeoisie, their political analysts, their economists, and their philosophers can see that humanity is facing decades of decline, but they don't know what can be done about it. They can't tell the difference between what is viable and what is decaying in the present society. They can't imagine modern productive forces separately from private property, or technological progress without private property, or indeed social progress without private property. They are helpless, and as a consequence, their philosophy is one of helplessness. Marxists can tell these things apart with ease, and that's why we know the direction that history must take, and that's why we can formulate a revolutionary program. While the bourgeois academics infect everything they touch with their helplessness and confusion. To them, economic crises, climate change, or the ominous human nature that supposedly, supposedly causes war or the oppression of women are uncontrollable forces of the same kind as the will of God. Our revolutionary philosophy enables us to see that private property and the nation state are barriers to development that must be abolished. The bourgeois wonder what to do with the nation state, especially in Europe. They cannot understand that it must be abolished. But dialectics shows us what kind of qualitative leap is needed here. The form of the nation state must be negated in order to preserve its content, namely the productive forces and the human civilization that relies on them. So it is our philosophy that gives us the insight needed to be free. It gives us the freedom to change society. But the philosophical ideas that dominate in capitalist society chain us to this society. And that is why Lenin calls philosophy a partisan science, a science that takes sides in the class struggle. That's why he says that bourgeois philosophies are our enemies, just as much as bourgeois economists. In the final analysis, and even though they may claim the opposite, both of these two kinds of academics are paid to write books about how capitalism is eternal and revolution is impossible. As Lenin said, they cannot be trusted one iota. Thank you, Sandro. Next speaker, actually our final speaker will be Jordi. I am very sorry to all those that I cut off the list. We had way too many speakers. A lot of the ideas and even concepts, words that we hear in our work in uh, the universities, uh, discourse, performativity, a lot of this uh, stuff, even though sometimes people who use these concepts and words do not realize, a lot of this goes back to Foucault. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about it. Now, uh, Foucault started, actually Foucault was at one point a member of the French Communist Party. He left disgusted by Stalinism, but his disgust with Stalinism took him in a completely reactionary direction. He started by, he started by studying the theory of power, and he recognized that power is also replicated or maintained uh, through institutions. We started by studying institutions like uh, prisons, jails, uh, the crime system, uh, but, also, but also the way ideology is reproduced through the school system and so on. But down this path he ended up with a completely wrong uh, conclusion. He said, he said, power is not a relationship that is exerted by one group against another. Uh, 
He said, power is everything and is everywhere. So he said, basically, power is exercised through norms, through knowledge, not, not that those who have knowledge have power over those who don't have knowledge, which is a reasonable, fair enough idea. But that the existence of knowledge itself <clears throat> is a form of power. He, he also said that science is a form of power. And uh, therefore he rejected science and also classification is power, and therefore classification must be rejected. Down this uh, rabbit hole you end up with nothing, basically. Not only this, he also said that norms are power, but you cannot, you cannot defy norms. Because by defying norms, you will be imposing a different set of norms, and that will in itself be power again. So this ideology is not, is not only nonsensical, it doesn't serve to explain anything. It's also profoundly pessimistic and therefore reactionary. Power exists, but it's everywhere, it's everything, and you cannot defy it. Or rather, if you defy power, you will end up with different forms of power, which is the same thing uh, as the starting point. Of course, a lot of this is, is based on this idea also that uh, this course is a form of oppression. I, I, I wouldn't want to tell you what this course really is because I don't, I don't understand it myself. I don't think they understand it themselves. But maybe what they're trying to say is that trying to explain something is a form of, uh, of uh, oppression. This ideology is completely remote from material uh, conditions. which are the ones on which power and oppression uh, is based. And they are completely obsessed with uh, language and the forms of things rather than the content. Recently, uh, Judith Butler gave an interview to the New York Times. And in this interview, she says something that caught my, my attention. She says this, what I like most about what young people are doing is the, is the experimentation. I love the experimentation, she said. Like, let's come up with a new language. Let's, let's play. But this is the interesting point. She said, let's see what language makes us feel better about our lives. And here you can see the really reactionary content of this ideology because it's not about fighting oppression. It's about finding a language that makes us feel uh, good about ourselves. Never mind the fact that we're still uh, oppressed, but at least we feel good uh, about ourselves. I was in Mexico recently, and a comrade from Yucatan who's at the university, I think she's studying biology, I can't remember. Oh, she's studying anthropology much worse. <laughs> not, not that anthropology is worse, but it's much more infected, perhaps, than, than biology. She said, she said, here in, in my university in, in Yucatan, if you, if you call a, a mass meeting, 
That's a form of violence. If you, if you have a debate and try to convince people, that's a form of violence. And if you take a decision at a mass meeting, if you take a vote, that is particularly a form of uh, violence. Because you are, you are trying to impose your opinion on, uh, on everybody else. And, and I'm, uh, you, might, you might think that this is funny, but this, this is the, the real conclusion of this. And, and she said that this is so pervasive in her university, it makes organizing extremely difficult. And this is the logical conclusion of ideas like the idea of the lived experience, intersectionality, of course, of course, people's lived experience of oppression is what drives many to organizing, to the struggle, to rebelling against the system. But this, but this is not what these people mean. What they mean is that only I can know about my conditions, my feelings, about how I, I experience oppression. And therefore, I cannot say anything about your lived experience of oppression. You, you cannot tell me anything about my, my uh, oppression because that I only, only, I'm the only one who knows about it. This is the most extreme form of uh, subjective idealism, which leads where? It leads to uh, extreme atomization. It, it leads to the disorganization of, uh, of any movements and not possible. Collective action is impossible on this basis. One time we were having a meeting about, about uh, and it leads also to censorship. Uh, these ideas are used as a form of censorship against the Marxists. You cannot speak. We were having a meeting about the death of Fidel Castro a few years ago at uh, LSC, University in London. And uh, there's this guy, German uh, PhD student who came. And we were, of course, def defending the Cuban uh, revolution with all our criticisms. And he said, you, you are white European privileged students, you cannot tell the Cubans what they should do or not. It just so happened that the only white privileged student in the meeting was him. <laughs> yes, it's true. I'm not, I'm not a white privileged student, I haven't been a student for a very long time. <laughs> And I said to him, I said to him, look, I've been to Cuba many times. Uh, in Cuba there are many opinions. I'm not forcing my opinions on anyone, but I want to discuss my opinions with as many Cubans as possible. And they are free to take it or leave it. And, uh, and what you're doing is to try, trying, trying to prevent myself from expressing my point of view. I wanted to mention in passing Silvia Federici, who wrote a very famous uh, book, unfortunately, called Caliban, Caliban and the Witch. Now we will, we will have to, unfortunately, we have to write about this book because it's quite uh, popular in these uh, circles. But if you look at this book, what, what it says is the following. Capitalism is, uh, came about in an extremely violent uh, manner, which you don't need Federici, you don't need to read Federici to understand. 
you can read you can read Marx's Capital, the, the chapter on the primitive accumulation of capital. You can read the conditions of the working class in England by Engels. It's horrible. But she says, capitalism came about in an extremely violent manner, and therefore, this should have never happened. And uh, in fact, she says, the position of women was much better under feudalism. Basing herself, basing herself on Foucault, she then goes on to reject modern institutionalized medicine, i.e. science, and to defend and to defend witchcraft. But you know, but you know what? You, you know what was the rate of death for uh, uh, as a result of childbirth? In, the, in medieval times. Well, I, I looked it up, and uh, according to one study, the combined mother and child death rate around uh, and because of, of childbirth was between 30 and 60 percent. So this is, this is really what, what Federici is advocating. Uh, chuck away modern institutionalized science. Also, these people reject modernity completely. But there's one example I like to use. You know, in um, 1790, I can't remember the exact year, the Haitian Revolution came about because the black slaves in Haiti, Haiti read the Declaration of the Rights of Men proclaimed by the French uh, Republic, French Revolution. And they said, and they said, oh, this is a Eurocentric document. <laughs> We want nothing to do with that. <laughs> no, they said, they said, if all men are equal, we are men, we are equal, and they rose up in a revolutionary struggle, they defeated three imperialist uh, powers and they achieved their freedom. So there you are, and that was in, uh, in uh, well, it wasn't in Latin America, but anyway, it's in the Caribbean, it's not, it's not in Europe. And this is the contradiction, because the, 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 the revolution that, uh, that uh, Hamid described, the, 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 the revolutionary rise of the bourgeoisie, was carried out under the slogan of rights for all, individual rights for all. And this in itself entered into contradiction with the real content which was, which was property rights, uh, political rights for those who have property uh, in reality. I'll just finish with this. All of this doesn't mean that the ideas are not important. And, and, and the title of this talk, as, as Hamid said, is the, is the need for a revolutionary philosophy. And I just wanted to quote from what Marx said about this. He said, the weapon of criticism cannot, of course, replay, criti replace criticism of the weapon. Material force must be overthrown by material force But theory also becomes a material force as soon as it, ha as, as it has gripped the mind of the masses. Thank you, Jordi. Um, there, just before I pass it over to Hamid for the wrap-up, um, there were a couple questions, uh, written questions, that I will read out now. Uh, so yes, yeah, someone asked, 
Uh, Hamid made the point that the bourgeois fight unconsciously, but the proletariat must fight consciously. I just wondered if you could clarify. That means you have lots of time. <laughs> uh, and then another comrade asked, why do we say that postmodernism is a glorification of feudalism? Yeah, so I'll pass it back to me. Well, comrade, comrade, it's been a really great uh, session. I don't have much time because uh, Jody took a lot of uh, my uh, time. They also took two of my quotes, so that... <laughs> <laughs> um, just on the two questions, uh, what was it? One is, the first one was, uh, the first one maybe we can discuss after because I think I spent half of my lead off <laughs> explaining it. <laughs> but with the second one, the glorification of feudalism, I think Jody just explained what that means. And uh, in fact, a lot of the subjectivist trends I just call them all postmodernism, but they all have different names, but they all say the same things. They all have a bone to pick with the Enlightenment and bourgeois philosophy, and they, they all have a sneering, like Foucault writes a whole book about all the crimes of early m medicine. And there were lots of crimes in the early days of medicine. There are still a lot of crimes in medicine, to be honest. But nevertheless, there was also a development which has which has uh, come to the aid of humanity. He also he's also written about psychiatry, uh, where he raises insanity to like a, a, a romantic thing, and especially the way that uh, mad people were treated in, uh, under feudalism, uh, on the basis of a completely unscientific method, by the way. Uh, so, uh, so I think that's pretty clear. I wanted to make two points uh, at the end here. Um, one is this question of um, all of these different trends of, of uh, postmodernism. They always end up defending the most reactionary forces. You know, in in India, I think someone asked about the subaltern people. I don't know much about them, but I do know that they, su they, they support the idea that the Indian masses are, are inclined towards Hindu fundamentalism by their nature. And that they, 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 they defend the, B, uh, the um, what's it called, BJP? Is it BJP, BPJ? Yeah, BJP. And they, they, defend, them, they defend them against those who attack them for being uh, reactionary. And they say, no, this is, this is the nature of indigenous Indian people. They also defend Islamic fundamentalism in the Middle East, and they defend the worst type of tribalism in Africa. And, in, and when it comes to the question of women's liberation, they put forward the idea of wages for housewives. That sounds like a nice thing, doesn't it? You know, housewives should be economically independent. I can support that. <laughs> but they want to keep m women in the house. We want to bring women out of the house and into society. That's the liberation of women, to bring women into the class struggle, side by side with the men. So that's how you fight for equality. So that, but, but, but those are kind of the most uh, obvious reactionary sides of it. But there's also, the side that Jody quoted for, for, uh, in this jo uh, quote that Jody mentioned from Judith Butler, you know, you can do small things to make yourself feel better. You know? And oftentimes you can discuss with people, honest people who kind of bought into these ideas, and they would, and they would say, yeah, we, we do need system change, but right now we should just do what we can do as individuals. In and of itself, that, I mean, this, we, we're not opposed to that. You're, this is a free democratic society. But the point is, that's all they talk about. It's a bit, dis, it's a bit disingenuous. If you really believe that, that system change is the only way to really change things, 
Why do you spend all of your time talking about the secondary, irrelevant, individual actions? You know, they talk about changing your language to make, you know, not to offend people. Or, you know, in the environmental movement, there's a million and one things you can do as an individual to save the environment. But no, no, we do want to have, we do want to, you know, overthrow capitalism, but this is just what we want to do now. And then we continue just talking about that. <laughs> but the point is, this is quite disingenuous, but in reality, in reality what's happening is that they oppose at every step collective action and put instead of it individual action. But class society does not develop on the basis of individuals. It develop, develops on the basis of class struggle. And the higher the class consciousness of the working class, the closer we are to changing this society. When you promote individual action as opposed to collective action, you oppose the, the process of class, uh, uh, the, the, I'd say, maturation of class consciousness. Um, and therefore, these ideas play a very reactionary role. Now, there's another thing I wanted to make, another point I wanted to make. You know, um, someone mentioned Kant and the categories. And the question is obviously, the big question in philosophy is where do ideas come from? You know, in philosophy, you have the categories of time and space and in identity and difference, contradiction. In Kant, these were independent entities that lived kind of eternally in our minds. But in reality, these are inherent relations of matter itself. And they're the result of trillions and trillions of interactions over hundreds of thousands of years that have gradually imprinted them into our consciousness to the point where we've lost sight of their origins. And that's why, with, that's why idealism can latch on to these. And in idealism, in, in idealism, they face humanity as, as monstrous forces that keep billions of men and women shackled in a humiliating and undignified state of ignorance. And this is also barbarism. This, this is one of the most vicious forms of barbarism. And it's upheld by three forces, by the division of labor between the hand and the mind, by the general impoverished state of the masses, and by the powerful interests of the ruling class. And we have to remember that the socialist revolution is not just a struggle for, for higher living standards and wages and so on, but a struggle against this barbarism for the true liberation of humanity from backwardness and general ignorance. Thank you very much.